Hey everybody, we are gonna wait to get started for just a minute. No one's here anyway, I am just talking to the eventual recording of this session. Um, so today, we're gonna be talking with Hercules Singh Munda, a language activist from Jharkhand, India. And here he is. I'll wait a minute and see if he can join. Hey, Anna. Hey, there you are. How's it going? Yeah, I'm good. Good evening. Good morning. I see it's a morning over there. <laughs> it is morning over here. Good evening to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so everybody else, uh, India and the Pacific Northwest are about 12 and a half hours apart in time zones. So uh, Hercules is kind enough to talk to us at night <laughs> as we are getting started on our Friday morning. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Good to see you. Yes. Yeah. So how are you doing this evening, Hercules? How has your Friday been? I'm just excited for the weekend to start. Yay! <laughs> yeah. How, are, how is the COVID situation there? Are you able to go do weekend things? Uh, no, it's mostly indoor. Uh, still, there is lockdown in India and uh, in, in the state that I am. Uh, but people are, uh, uh, from last two days, there is zero positive case in my district. So that's a good news. That is awesome. I yeah. hope that it will continue on a, a downward slope from here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, wow, we've already got a lot of folks joining us. Hi, everybody. So just to remind you, today we have the pleasure of talking with Hercules Singmunda. And actually, this is a good moment for perhaps you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work and what you do. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm Hercules Singh Munda. I belong to the Munda tribe, which is, uh, we speak an uh, Austroasiatic language from the Munda group to be techni like talking technical. Uh, and uh, I'm an engineer by training, but uh, with time, I shifted to language conservation and uh, currently I work as a language conservationist or you can call it language activist. And I'm trying to promote indigenous languages across India. Awesome. So, yeah. yeah. And so I think a lot of our viewers are joining us from outside India and they might not know very much about the indigenous language situation there. So can you tell us a little bit about Adivasi languages generally? Is India a very linguistically diverse country? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, like, if you talk about India in general, uh, one out of every seven person in the world is an Indian. So similarly, one out of every 10 language is a Indian language. And uh, India has around 700, uh, roughly 700 languages. Uh, 780 is the precise number. And uh, that accounts for one tenth of like total world language that exists in the world. So, and out of that, more than 70 to 80% of languages are indigenous languages and they have been spoken, they are very regional specific and also community specific. So India is truly diverse in that. Like when we talk about India as a diverse country, so it's, it's these linguistic features that supports the cultural diversity. Hmm. Yeah, and, and where you are specifically, what's the language context like? So what do people speak where you live? Uh, so uh, I live in the central part of India, which is, uh, which is more tribal or Adivasi dense population in area. And uh, in my own state, there are 19 languages and 32 different Adivasi communities. So it's very multilingual and uh, on an average uh, each individual speaks three language apart from uh, english or hindi which is used in a mainstream like which is used in the economic purposes but apart from that uh, on an average every indigenous or adivasi person can speak three language uh, yeah which is declining by the way which is declining mm. but uh, on an average yeah yeah. Wow. So multilingualism is really common today. 
is that, do you notice like a difference in how young people and older folks deploy multilingualism? Is it the same across generations or do you feel like it's changing? Uh, yeah, there, there's a decline in number of languages. So when I talk, when I say that uh, on an average, each Adivasi uh, young generation can speak three languages. So obviously the elders, they, they knew much like many more languages. On an average, they knew seven languages. Uh, one of my research uh, last year I surveyed uh, and that revealed that maximum a person knows nine languages. So that was really astonishing for me. And uh, and there has been decline in the number of languages uh, one can speak. Uh, and we, we have something called uh, language compartmentalization. So when we go to market, we speak a and we, we speak a pidgin or uh, like it's a newly evolved language called sadri but uh, when we are in our own community then we speak a different language and when we go to, go to any administrative work such as hospital or government offices then we speak a different language hmm. that's so cool this kind of hyper multilingualism is definitely one of my favorite topics I would love to hear more about sort of in your family and in your personal experience, what are the languages in your repertoire and what do you use them for? Okay. Uh, so to give you a bit of cultural background about myself, uh, I'm the second generation who is getting an education. Uh, my father, uh, he, he is a government official, but at the same time, he, 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 on, a, on his free time, he prefers to do uh, gardening and farming. He is still like, he's rooted to his uh, native occupation, I would say. Uh, and uh, so that's the background I come from. And uh, when we talk about the language in my community, in my family, so uh, my mom knows she she can speak Mandari. She can speak the local market language, which is Sadri, and then she can even speak Bengali. Uh, then apart from that, Hindi and English are two other thing languages that's there. And uh, she she also can like not proficiently, but she she can speak Ho and Sadri. Those two are similar languages. That's On incredible. contrary, I, I just speak Mundari and uh, Sadri a bit. Uh, and uh, I understand Santhali and Ho because do, do, they come from like, they're they are cousin, sisters or brother, you can call them. So yeah, I am able to understand it, but I'm not like fluently, I, I cannot converse using those two languages. Wow, and then probably Hindi also? Yeah, when when you go to market or let's say Hindi, you generally speak when you are going for uh, going to any academic institution or government official. Uh, that's the time you use Hindi, and uh, then there's, there's there's another group of people who are kind of a uh, who have studied in the metropolitan uh, like cities, and then when you talk to them, uh, the they somehow relate English as their like native language, and they, that's the language they prefer to communicate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's another set of people uh, who for whom in, like we use a different language. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's pretty common in a lot of places around the world. Folks who sort of adopt English as their own mother tongue and identity language for various reasons. But do you, yeah, do you I, have I any feelings reasons, about those folks? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, uh, they, they always, there's obviously a sense of pride attached to it, English, because that's a, uh, that's a language uh, in which you can uh, like do business uh, on a global level. So mm -hmm. people feel they, they get a sense of dignified identity when they speak in English, but uh, at the same time, they are uh, like, the younger generation feel ashamed to talk in uh, their native language or the Adivasi language because uh, there have been multiple reasons and few of them are uh, because it, it doesn't have any utility value and by utility value I mean it, it's not recognized even my language which is Mandari it's not one of the constitutionally recognized language like India has 22 constitutionally recognized language and Mandari is not one of them so uh, that that's the reason uh, like people don't feel that pride in them that uh, they they cannot associate they they don't feel constitutionally pride i would say mm. 
I haven't heard that phrase, constitutional pride. That's an interesting way to frame the, the Indian official language situation. Yeah. yeah. And so is that something you find a lot among young folks like around your age? Is there a lot of pride in Adivasi languages or is there sort of a desire to move towards English and other economically dominant languages? Um, I think it's the later because not many people, uh, not many people, they, they find a worth or value in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, also because like, as I said, I'm a second generation who is getting education. So uh, for me, uh, I, I, in a way, I have been I've disassociated from my native land because my, like, let's say my father, he still goes back and he prefers farming or let's say do gardening. But when I was, in my free time, I, I prefer to go for hiking and or let's say I, go, I prefer to go for a long drive. So, you know, that's that has become my culture. And when there is a shift of culture, people tend to lose their language. And that's what has been happening. Um, uh, so, uh, like, what I prefer in my free time, uh, it is totally different than what my elder generation prefer to do in their free time. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly, when you look into the Adivasi culture, there's a concept of a community gathering called Akhra. And uh, generally, people came together and they dance and they played songs and all the women would be like at the end of the day they will be talking how their day was and uh, sh sharing happiness and griefs and mm -hmm. male, male will be like dancing and playing music but now with modernization or let's say as we are developing uh, mm -hmm. uh, this sense of community and that sense of belonging to a community is vanishing like it's uh, people don't feel anymore that they are a part of community and even if they feel they are a part of community it's the modern community uh, it's not the the native and indigenous community that, that they feel related to mm. yeah I, I think i sensed some air quotes around developing when you said that <laughs> do, you, do you feel like there's there's something important that's being lost when people move away from adivasi cultures yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, like development is uh, it. it uh, whenever we talk about development, the idea that is uh, inculcated into the young mind is uh, Adivasi culture is bad, and uh, it's a culture with a lot of problems, or uh, it's a culture which uh, which is uneducated and. No, I would say backward. There's also a concept of mainstream and then backward stream. But I question that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, being educated and being uh, having a degree are two different things. Uh, I very openly question that. Uh, okay, there, there, nobody in the tribal Adivasi community had a doctorate degree or was a certified medical practitioner doesn't mean that they didn't had medical solutions to like things or uh, they just because they don't have a degree doesn't mean that they don't have a way to count things or measure things so that's that's a big difference uh, that is the like, stream of thoughts i would say that uh, just because you have a, a degree or something which validates which get validated in the mo modern society it doesn't mean that the native or the indigenous societies are bad and I, if you if you look at uh, societies in general i think every society has problems um, adivasi societies obviously have problems of they don't they are not like economically so strong but if you look at the modern society they also have problems like there has a higher number of divorces uh, if you look at the whole pandemic situation there were more number of casualties in the urban areas in comparison to uh, the rural areas mm -hmm. so i think both it, it's it's uh, not justified or it's uh, it's very it, it's wrong to say that only adivasi community has problem when when uh, even the modern societies have problem they, it's just that the, their problems are different and our problems are different yeah amen and i really i love what you're saying about how it's so important to acknowledge that academic structures are not the only way of validating knowledge right there's knowledge production 
outside of, you know, a, a school with a degree that's exactly as valid. And I think it's about time people recognize that. So round of applause. <laughs> yeah. And so you have been working really actively towards revitalizing Adivasi languages, especially Mundari. And I'm curious kind of what sparked that for you? Was there a moment in your life when you knew that you were going to start language work? Uh, there was not, like, I wouldn't say it's it's a one night I saw a dream or like I got some vision and then <laughs> and next morning I have to work on language. But uh, there was a series of events or there was a pe period of time, like tenure of time where uh, I went through certain things and then I like I came to a conclusion that uh, this is what I want to do and this is why I want to do because uh, anybody can work on language but why specifically me and why do i have to work so i found my reason why i have to i want to do it and do the work on it mm, okay so t tell us about that reason <laughs> okay uh so uh, <clears throat> uh, early on my in my like just after graduating or uh, completing my engineering i realized that uh, one of the realization was uh, the similar thing which is you do the being educated and having a uh, education qualification are two different things and uh, what worked for me was being educated not having a education qualification and uh, then uh, with time um, uh, I, I had set some personal goals uh, that I wanted to achieve. Eventually, I did achieve them. But uh, in the course of time, I realized that uh, in order to achieve these financial goals or these quantifiable goals, like the numbers, I was missing what lies between the numbers, which is the feelings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... I, I I had financial goals. I had few numbers that I wanted to achieve. I did achieve them, but uh, the cost of which was uh, losing personal, uh, like I was not satisfied. Uh, I also had a loss of like uh, personal health, personal relationship. Um, I realized that I'm getting away from my culture and which I, I really enjoyed. I mean, uh, because uh, to me, my culture was brought as if it's, uh, I have seen the grandiose nature of Adivasi culture, which is the community coming together. You know, like right now, when we talk about community, the number is so small. But in terms of Adivasi culture, it's very grandiose in nature, which, which, is, which people cannot even imagine or comprehend. So, so I, I had that moment. And then uh, I realized that I don't want uh, to just to... Uh, live in the numbers, but actually live my life. And uh, I also wanted to do something uh, which goes beyond my life. Because if if I keep working for numbers, eventually the numbers or the money will go away as I go, like, as I leave the earth. But I wanted to do something which which has bigger impact or bigger consequences. My like basically my work should preside over my life. And uh, that got me thinking that what what next I could do. And uh, eventually at that time, uh, uh, I came across a concept of Ikigai, which is what you want to do in life and you should be doing what you can give best. And I realized that, you know, the, uh, the best things are always very simple and it's very natural. And language is one of those things that you, you don't like externally learn it. You learn it very naturally. So in my case also, I, I learned the language very naturally. I don't even remember when I learned language. Uh, I just know, like one day uh, when I have to talk in Mandari, I just know that I know the language. So it was that or organic, natural. And uh, then I, I decided that uh, I should teach the language. The final nail in the coffin was where my cousins uh, who are all under seven years. And uh, I realized that they do not know the beauty of our language or they do not know the beauty of uh, Adivasi culture. And uh, let me give you an example. Like each language has a be beauty. It has a sense of, uh, it has its own meaning. And uh, so for example, you know, uh, English, there's a word called love, which is an emotion. Uh, in Greek, you have six ways you can explain love. There are six forms of love. 
um similarly when you talk about uh, pronouns such as you in hindi, in english then in hindi we have two pronouns which gives it more like it refines the language you can uh, when you say you then in hindi you can tell that uh, you can explicitly tell that the person whom you are referring is a elder or a younger like tum or aap Uh, so th- these these are the uh, features of language uh, in even in mandari like which is my native language i can explain rain in five different forms mm. so uh, uh, these things i i felt like okay my cousins they 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 are obviously uh, like they speak english but mm. at the cost of forgetting their own culture and not ever uh, just forgetting but they you know it's something which they deserve and it's fun to know a language it's fun to know the culture and they were missing it so basically i do not want it to compromise with their happiness because as a younger uh, as a elder member of the family i wanted to ensure to give them the uh, give them happiness which they deserve and that was language so the, i started language uh, teaching or like i started work to work on language after realizing that my cousins couldn't uh, speak nor understand our native language oh that's beautiful so your language work really at its heart is about caring for yourself and for the younger members of your community yeah yeah oh that's lovely yeah, yeah. because you know they say like um, there's there's this common uh, philosophy adivasi philosophy is uh, uh, we think about our future and we shape the future like uh, that's why adivasi are also called forest resource manager because they know how to maintain the forest so similarly i think every the present generation should also think about the next younger generation mm-hmm. and that's how i uh, uh, so i thought like what something that i could give to the next generation and that was language so mm-hmm. yeah that's my gift to the younger generation yeah and i guess hypothetically if some day you have kids what languages do you want to raise them in uh definitely I mean, that, that, okay that's a very interesting question first of all like okay uh if i have a ever kids um i think I, i'll go, definitely mandari uh but i would also want them to learn the language uh which is uh, like ap- apart from the mainstream languages is english or hindi um i would also want them to uh, learn languages which which are uh, i would say uh, very different in nature like so i uh, basically let's say you know uh, uh, language are also literature are also associated with language uh, so i would want them to read and whatever choice they have like whichever literature they prefer i would want them to read in its native language i mean uh, you know there is lot of meaning that get lost during the translation so i i would keep it open ended that they can learn any language but i'll make sure make it compulsory for them to l- read the literature in its original form i mean uh, i'm i'm very interested into poetry and then uh, i read poems in its translated form and then i read poems in its original language mm-hmm. and then uh, i i realize that there's a big difference between these two <laughs> yeah are there any languages that you can read a little bit of just for poetry purposes that you don't really speak um uh, i can read uh, like i have been following works of uh, kushwan singh and a few of uh, faz amant pays like these are urdu uh, poets so i've been like i i can re- because they are written in devanagari script so i i can i read them but uh, so yeah urdu you can say i i'm reading but i'm not the script it's just the language that i'm getting a hold of that's still pretty I, I, cool so i i really want to learn uh, turkish and mm. persian because uh, i've been following lot of work persian writers or uh, turkish uh, i recently read like you know the classics are rumi and all so those are there but also uh, there's there are writers like uh, there's a book called 40 rules of love uh, which is a precursor to rumi that's a, that was really interesting for me so uh, maybe i want to read that in its original form wow 
You are extremely ambitious language wise. <laughs> you already speak five languages and you're going for several more. I, I respect that. Americans are very poor at multilingualism. And so, you know, I don't know very many people who can speak more than two or three languages. So extremely impressed. Yeah. And hi, hi, viewers. I just want to let you all know that you are welcome to ask questions as we are talking. Uh, if you have any questions for Hercules about Adivasi languages, language revitalization through tech, anything else, just uh, drop them in the chat and we will respond when we see them. And so Hercules, I also wanted to ask, you have done a lot of different work around language, but your first degree was in engineering, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you mentioned this concept of ikigai, one of the components of that is what you're good at or what you're skilled in, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. would you say that you're mostly bringing, what are the skills that you feel like you are most strongly positioned to bring to language work? And how does that help you choose what to do? Oh, okay. Uh, so look, uh, I, I'm, I agree that I'm a trained engineer. Uh, but, you know, I, it's a case in, specifically in India that uh, you have a different training or you get a different degree and then you work on a different industry or sector altogether. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my case, uh, I, I do have a degree in engineering and computer like information technology, uh, but I found that uh, uh, more than engineering, I've been trained uh, to work with community because, you know, uh, uh, looking back, I realized that even before going, I started schooling. Uh, I was there with my community members, like my peers in the community, and I was playing with them. Uh, in social gatherings, I was helping my elders, like my mom or dad, organize uh, the whole event. And then uh, I realized that you don't, like I said, you don't need a degree to be educated. So in my case, uh, uh, I, I did ha got training for engineering for four years, but on a larger picture, uh, I was trained to be a good manager through my community and in, in, in a, like a much larger time frame. So yeah, management is one of my forte. Like I think uh, I'm good with people. You know, like that sense because I have experienced that sense of belonging in my community. So through my work, I want to ex bring that to my work place and bring everyone together, give them a feeling of uh, community. So that's one thing I like to bring. Then obviously uh, my cultural background in terms of like linguistic background, the cultural background, that's one thing I bring. Uh, and then there are like sub, like minor uh, skill set that I bring, which is like engineering or uh, Designing is another thing that I, I do in my free time. So, yeah, I, th I think uh, uh, I, I primarily bring team, uh, team management uh, or how you deal with a group of people. That's my forte. And then there are other skills which are sub uh, like supported, which are there in support. Yeah. Well, I, I think we can confirm that you are good with people. We have somebody in the comments being like, you're very talented and appreciated. Oh, did we lose you? There you are. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. We got we got a lot of love for you in the comments here. So I think you're correct mm -hmm. that you're good with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, oh. yeah. And a good photographer. Yes, Hercules is multi-talented. We're so, so lucky to have him as a summer intern at ELP. That is a true blessing for us. Hey, no worries. Mm -hmm. You are super popular today. Mm -hmm. oh. All right, one second. We're going to let him answer that or perhaps mute it. I don't know. Yeah, and hi, everybody. If you are just joining, welcome. We are talking to Hercules Singmunda, who is a language activist and, well, what was the term you used other than language activist? Conservationist? Yeah, I made that up, conservationist. No, it's, it's a thing. So the, the University of Hawaii, their program is called Language Documentation and Conservation. 
And conservation, I don't know if it's the most broadly used term in language work, but it's sort of sometimes used as equivalent to revitalization or preservation, which is not my favorite word, but yeah, it's, it's totally a thing. You can call yourself a language conservationist. Yeah. Yeah. And so I am really interested to hear about this project you started with the goal of helping folks like your little cousins. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Trilingo? Sure. Um, so uh, first I'll explain about the name. Uh, the project is called Trilingo. And uh, the name's origin is, uh, it's a combination of two words, which is tri and lingos. Tri refers to tribal and uh, lingos refers to just like linguistic or lingos in general means word. So the idea was to do something for uh, Adivasi languages and Adivasi are generally termed as tribal in India. So tri-lingo, that's how the name came from. But it's also a play on the fact that India is a trilingual country. Uh, and uh, by trilingual, I mean there's 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 one language which is used for official purposes then which is oh, there's another language which is used for conversation purposes like in general and then there are these regional languages so that's why i say india is a trilingual country so that's how the idea of trilingual started and uh, as i was saying like uh, i didn't want it to uh, leave my training whatever i was trained like basically engineering um, so uh, I decided to do something which will be a combination of uh, technology, uh, entrepreneurship, and uh, social impact. That that was the whole idea. And then uh, I realized that uh, uh, in context of India, uh, academics and institutions have failed drastically. I, I must say it that uh, uh, because... Uh, there have been, like in case of Mundari, uh, the Mundari dictionary was written somewhere around 1920. That's like, that's 100 years back. But nobody, uh, like we don't know, that, that, that was not made public or I would say it's not as, it's not a common knowledge. And that makes me question that what was, what has academic been doing? Like, uh, so th I realized that, okay, it's obvious that academic, is not so pro proactive about Adivasi language and culture. And then I realized that in case of government as well, uh, or any institutions, uh, there like there is not much progress. And then uh, that's why I took a route of entrepreneurship, which is uh, because entrepreneurs have only one goal, which is uh, the social entrepreneurs, not the mm. other entrepreneurs. The social entrepreneurs have a one goal, which is making sure that everybody gets benefited from what they are doing. They do it for community. And uh, that's why I choose entrepreneurship. And Trilingo is uh, is a mother tongue based language learning platform. Uh, we, we, the idea is to use uh, native languages or mother, uh, like mother tongues to, uh, to, uh, to uh, as a means of teaching, you know, like, uh, because the current education system in India uh, doesn't sub inculcate indigenous languages or Adivasi languages. And because of that, uh, more than uh, like 50%, 55% .50 uh, students, they drop out before they complete their primary or secondary education. Uh, and, th and and that's one of the reason I think uh, Adivasis are not um, uh, proactive in uh, economic activities or any uh, development activities they are only always the one who who's who are at the bottom of the pyramid so mm, i chose education as a medium uh, wherein i can ex like i can promote the language and trilingual is an attempt to promote mother tongue based education mm. yeah that's uh, that's really important there's uh, a yeah. If, if y'all aren't familiar with it, the UN has done quite a lot of research on the benefits of mother tongue based multilingual education, along with many, many scholars. So this is not, obviously Hercules is right and you should listen to him, but it's not just Hercules saying this, right? Most of the, the researchers and NGOs out there have research supporting the fact that multilingual mother tongue based education helps kids learn better. They have better educational outcomes. 
and it contributes to their well-being and sense of positive identity. So I'll let you go on, Hercules. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows this is really true. Go support mother song education in your country. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, absorb or get knowledge in a language which you are not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it's it's simply, it's a, it's illogical to me when, when someone says that in order to get knowledge, you have to adopt to a new language. I mean, why can't the same knowledge be translated or if you know knowledge in itself are very universal in nature i mean if uh, if it's like uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 that doesn't means in my language it would be different then why do we need to ask someone to learn a new language and then they will learn that 2 plus 2 is 4 that is like simply a waste of time money and human brain capacity uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, and it's, uh, it's intimidating to try and learn something new while trying to also learn a new language. Doing those things at once can be overwhelming, for, especially for a little kid, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's so true. I mean, you're trying to do two things in parallel and like there is enough evidence that when you do uh, two things in parallel, does it, things doesn't go good. Like humans, you know, uh, uh, there's a saying in Hindi which says, uh, which goes on to say that don't put your feet on two boats. So similarly, <laughs> like uh, don't try to learn a language and don't try to get uh, learn like get knowledge. Those two are two different things. But uh, the sad part is uh, not not like education infrastructure, education uh, institution don't realize that, mm -hmm. and uh, they they club it together. Even though there is like as you said, UN has pro like this policies even in india there are policies uh, the current national education framework suggests to use mother tongue based education because but then is there is this whole idea of uh, centralizing education and that because of that uh, there is like the mother native language gets out of the picture mm -hmm. so mm, that's that's uh, so yeah that that's the scene uh, talking a bit more about trilingo so you know, uh, when you talk about language and culture, you can uh, you can choose any medium, or you can choose uh, like to transfer those knowledge. It can be music, it can be dance, it can be painting. Uh, the my medium is technology because I uh, uh, there are two reasons to it. First, I see that uh, Adivasi language and culture are inadequately represented in the digital infrastructure, digital world, or digital space. Um, you won't find much information about uh, Adivasi or indigenous, any information on Adivasi or indigenous communities uh, on internet. And that leads to uh, people assume, assuming whatever little information that they get. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one thing. And then the next thing is, uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, technology is an enabler. Like, you know, uh, technology can be used for good. Uh, and it it can be made inclusive because the current technologies like the IT technologies are very monolingual in nature. They don't support. There is not much diversity. But uh, I believe that they they can be made, and uh, that's why I wanted to use technology. And uh, yeah, technology, I mean, you can technology has become. Uh, I think it won't be wrong to say it has become the sixth sense. Uh, for human beings, so uh, you cannot just ignore it. Uh, it's technology is everywhere, from uh, your telephone or like mobile phone to even uh, the television. And technology has penetrated uh, to all spectrum of humans. Like I would say, uh, across different socioeconomic backgrounds, across different geographical regions. Uh, so I realize that technology can be a really good medium. Uh, and that's why I choose technology because uh, there are two things that technology supports, the IT technology. Uh, first is it uh, transcends uh, geographical boundaries. You don't need to be like, you know, sitting in India and then only, uh, then only you can learn. Uh, there's a very good example from Mundari or Kuduk wherein uh, there's a professor called Professor um, Tosaki Osada. 
he's he he's a he he's a professor at Kyoto University Japan but he speaks much fluent mandari than i can speak and that made me realize that uh, languages uh, cannot be confined to a geographical location or certain set of people uh, mm-hmm. geogra- lo- languages are for humans and that's why uh, uh, technology supports that you know it uh, with technology like digital technology you don't need to be in a confined geographical area and uh, also technology can be made very personal in nature i mean uh, you can have good in buildings but again everybody has to come at given time but when we talk about the digital technology you have it in your phone or you have it in your mobile tel- tablet and you can learn it as you, at any moment as you want so that's these are the two reasons i chose like uh, i prefer i've chosen digital technology as a means to promote language yeah yeah and you noted that one of the benefits of technology is it's not geographically limited right when you're doing tech based language learning So was part of who you were thinking of in founding Trilingo maybe Adivasi youth in the diaspora folks who aren't living around their community and don't have the opportunity to learn language in person? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the spectrum of Adivasi uh, youth, then there are people uh, and one end you will be fi- you'll find uh, people like members who are very much immersed in the culture because they are they are at the epicenter of the culture uh, but there are there's these people at the other spectrum like they they are uh, members who live in the boundary of the cultural the culture and they are the one who are uh, like they live in a different geographical location uh, they uh, do not get chance to participate in community activity community uh, like functions and activities and uh, so i realized that uh, we need to do something for the people who are getting away from the culture because uh, not for the people who are already in the culture i mean uh, so yeah that was the whole idea that uh, if we can somehow stop this uh, dissipating like you know th- that uh, one generation by one generation like set of people who are going away from the culture if we can somehow stop them from going like uh, going away or uh, maybe we can save this or like we can keep the culture intact i won't say saving but keep the culture intact yeah yeah that's that's a really beautiful thought is to to bring together folks who don't have this same access to community uh, do you feel like you're one of those folks it sounds like you do have pretty regular ability to go participate in community activities but do you feel like you're kind of on the the boundaries or do you feel like you're you're centered in community more than a lot of other younger folks uh i would say my uh i was centered in community uh as a kid but you know uh, uh, uh there are like uh, basically education because as a reason people often migrate apart from the job like apart from economic activities education is a reason why people migrate and i happen to be one of those cases wherein i migrated uh, from my uh, my motherland to, to like away from my motherland to get better uh, education to have better economic opportunities and uh, so at present i would say i i have Uh, over the, in the last two years i have tried to get regain my cultural identity and uh, reclaim my cultural uh, background but until then for the past uh, 12 years i was drifting away from my culture mm. yeah and and so when you started this platform for online language learning to sort of help people come back to that cultural center what are some of the responses you've got how do people react to this opportunity to do this work online uh uh i would say uh, uh out of every uh, 10 person there's one person who is not so supportive of language because uh they don't see a value to it mm-hmm. but then there are people who 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 really want to learn their language but until now they do not have any accessibility tools or platforms where they can learn um, so Uh, yeah there have been positive responses uh, but at the same time there are these opposite forces who who due to like can be like one of the reason can be they don't find any 
value in it or they want to assimilate the adivasi language and they they they, they try to like uh, discredit or pull down like you know they don't support the work mm. yeah what are what are some of the arguments they make besides you know it's not economically beneficial and and how do you respond to those attitudes i don't know if that's a difficult question you can skip it if you want <laughs> no uh, so i i'll bring out a specific case uh, uh, one of the person he said uh, languages were, uh, languages are, are supposed to die mm. and uh, my res- re- response to him was uh, you know languages are like air uh, you you don't realize until you have it but the moment you don't have a air you you literally die mm. and so is language i mean you don't realize the value of language until you have it but the moment you don't have a uh, the language i mean just try be quiet for a minute and try to communicate a idea can you do it no i mean nobody in the audience can do it so uh, that's the importance of language and there are these people who who don't have enough knowledge and then they uh, just because they don't und- understand uh, they think like it's not right so their inadequate knowledge uh, they operate or they respond on basis of their inadequate knowledge mm-hmm. yeah that's that's really important work you're doing to sort of raise awareness and educate other folks who might have internalized these ideas about language so thank you for doing that work it's really important stuff yeah and i'm also curious like what kind of other initiatives besides digital language learning are there going on to sort of get out of us a youth excited and engaged in language work like are there any favorite projects that you want to tell us about other than trilingo uh, okay uh, so uh, first i'll tell other projects that have been done by other community members and then i'll talk about what i have been doing apart from trilingo digital mm-hmm. education so uh, when, with the event of internet and mobile uh, like mobile technology um, f- folks have been putting out um, music c- cultural dance and even uh, like uh, anything related to kitchen or uh, even dressing i i would say uh, they have been putting it out on youtube that's that's because uh, you you all you need is a good mobile phone and then you would need a good internet connection and people have been putting a lot of specifically music and videos like people have been putting out in youtube and that has been a good source of uh, entertainment uh, and that real like i see inter- like music as a good uh, way to uh, i would say uh, good way to come get everyone under one roof i mean unite everyone music is you can you unite people uh, and music also gives you a sense of belonging because uh, you enjoy the tune but at the same time you know that it's it's my native language and then this like you know uh, finding value is all about finding happiness and when you you actually enjoy the music then you f- you f- feel proud you f- you realize that there is happiness associated with your language and uh, so th- that has been there then um, there have been uh, attempts to promote adivasi food uh, and clothing uh, so these are two uh, uh, like i'd say uh, different uh, two aspects of community which are getting promoted uh, and about so yeah the, the, this is what community has been doing uh, now uh, what i have been doing apart from uh, digital education um, i did promote on social media uh, we did some quizzes uh, we started a podcast series uh, but it it was not launched uh, oh. and, uh, okay uh, there's one more thing uh, which i've been uh, like it's very early on but i think it's a good time to share it uh, i've been working on something uh, which is about uh, match making uh, basically i realized that you know Uh, one way to promote language is you teach a language but then uh, when two people like you know our next generation come like to existence or like next generation happen when there is marriage and uh, so uh, and with 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 like 
development people have been drifting geographically and drifting away from the community it's very hard to find a match or partner in your community so i realized that in order to promote language you should also focus on ensuring that the next generation uh, like to uh, the next generation uh, are like the the current generation uh, they know their language and then 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 only they can promote it it like transfer it to the next generation so i think uh, marriage is one point wherein uh, uh, if if let's say uh, two people belonging to same language community they if they come together then it's obvious that uh, their next generation will be talking in their it's the same language but if there are uh, if there are two different language then generally in in context of india it's generally the language of the father which is like because you know the whole patriarchal society so even though we call it mother tongue but the mother's language get uh, get a back seat hmm. oh interesting so this is going to be sort of like a, an adivasi dating app like indigenous tinder like, <laughs> you can call it indigenous uh, <laughs> oh that's a nice term that's really nice <laughs> that's cool that's yeah. a great idea i think that that is a need that i've heard expressed by especially a lot of younger indigenous folks like i'd love to marry somebody from my community but i don't know where to meet them yeah so yeah. i i think you've got an idea here and actually we have a question from the audience that might tie into this So uh Alone Walker Shiv Kumar Nag says, uh bro, I have a question. How can we motivate or promote our languages in urban areas as most of the urban people usually speak English and Hindi? So, it's a tough question. How do you go about language reclamation in cities? Uh okay. I think uh before you promote a language, I think you should promote about the culture i mean language itself is very vast and uh, it's not oh, you cannot explain or you cannot uh, articulate in it in one day but you you can take different aspect of culture because language and culture are interrelated so you can you can start off by simple things like uh, inviting your friends for a native meal i mean you you cook uh, your native food or let's say uh, that that can be a good starting point or uh, then you can go about uh, watching movie like enjoying to the songs are out there which are there the native songs because uh, you know the in, in, in even in entertainment there is this hierarchy that if you if you listen to uh, a uh, global language songs in a global language then you are like more educated mm -hmm. but if you listen songs to in your native tongue you are like indie and uh, you are like a uh, laid back so i think you can start off with the small things which which would will take you couple of hours or it can be your weekend plan so how would we start with these like foods and music uh, which you enjoy and then slowly uh, when people actually start to enjoy it then you can tell about the importance of it like uh, uh you can explain the meaning of the songs so you can explain the rational behind why do we eat that food you know because a lot of adivasi foods are very seasonal like you won't find that that in every, throughout the year so you can ex like explain them that uh, how this food why why we eat this foods in in this specific time and then most probably uh, you you will be able to map it back to nature and then from there on you can take different routes i mean language is obviously one of those yeah yeah those are all really cool suggestions i hope they are useful to our viewers who are kind of looking for ways to bring culture and language into urban life which can totally be challenging um let's see we oh gosh we just have a few minutes left so if anybody else has questions get them in fast But I wanted to ask you Hercules this is a tough question it's kind of a big picture question if you are dreaming big and we are looking at your best possible future what do you hope the language situation for Mundari and other Adivasi languages looks like in say 20 years a generation down the line okay uh, you know uh, i feel india is a very diverse country and uh, more than uh, more than 
being i would say wait let me let it let me put it correctly so uh, yeah india is a very diverse country and we can be truly indian uh, only when we contribute like we live up to the meaning and uh, when uh, you, you know when we talk about progress or development uh, we call it socio economic progress uh, but of lately we have been only focusing on the economic part but not the socio part so i think uh, the few we should also focus on the socio part uh, and uh, so yeah in context of india we, we should all focus on the uh, socio part in terms of uh, uh, like across the globe or on a more universal level i think uh, language is one of those attributes of being human uh, if you are a human you must have a language so uh, language is very essential to your human like you know there's example you cannot imagine a fish which which cannot swim so mm-hmm. similarly you cannot imagine a human who can who doesn't has a language i mean even the deaf or people they have a sign languages so yes to in 20 20 years down the line uh, i believe uh, the world will be more multilingual the world will be more diverse otherwise there won't be anything human i mean to be human is to have a language and uh, to have a language it means you have a diff- unique perspective on the world so uh, if you want to have a, a brighter pic- the brighter picture would be a multilingual world where each language and culture is uh, is equal uh, there's no uh, i would say discrimination or there is no stereotyping of language or cultural communities my my personal aspiration is like uh, trilingo has a goal to uh, enable 1 million students like adivasi students uh, to learn uh, to, to gain knowledge in their own language so th- that's a very ambitious goal but uh, it's it's a decade long goal that we want to achieve and uh, also uh, if you look at the history of language revitalization uh, I, hebrew is a very good case, like case study and you realize uh, it took it took roughly 400 years for hebrew to uh, be like to get uh, to get back to like that current uh, status where it is so i i think uh, it's not just about 20 years or it's not about one herculean lifetime but it's about that 400 years and it would take multiple herculean lifetime to uh, for language to be like you know truly uh, emerging and I, and i believe in history like there's a saying that goes like history repeats itself so i believe that history will repeat itself and when um, there will be a point of time when just like in the case of hebrew people will will have a very strong urge to reclaim their language and uh, at that moment uh, people will be finding a solution and if we d- we do not start now like uh, then there won't be a solution at that moment so uh, my work uh, is not for uh, the next 10 years or it's not for the next 20 years but i think it's more about how we shape the next century or the next 400 years uh, down the line there would be some like i i believe that the world will be truly multilingual that's that's a beautiful vision and either even if neither of us lives to see that world let's let's keep working for it yeah 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 and i guess i take it you don't agree with elon musk that all human language will be obsolete in the next 5 years <laughs> the goofiest things I ever heard. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I do not agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same. Yeah. Well, we have one more question from the audience. So, how do we promote languages which do not have a written script? Oh, that's a big question. Do you want to take a shot at it, Hercules? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. look at all the. Uh, you know, uh, script only come to existence when you need to document. or you need to preserve it uh, for a later time i mean uh, if you look at human evolution then uh, even when when a child we child grows you see the, the child learns to speak first and then 
only when he starts schooling uh, then uh, then he starts to write and then you know show homework and uh, like save his knowledge for the later time and uh, same is for human like all the languages languages were very oral in nature until uh, there was a need to document it and produce the same uh, context at later point of time and that's how scripts come into play so i think uh, you can uh, the, the, i know like a lot of adivasi community language communities have this aspiration to have a unique script for their own which is really nice but uh, i want to say or state here that even if you don't have a script you don't need to be disheartened i mean uh, you know take example of uh, english as a language i mean we write in no roman script so uh, that's that's a different language and that's a different script and uh, so yeah i think it's it's perfectly fine if you don't have a script you just need to write it uh, using any other script which perfectly represents all the sounds of the language and that is more than a, a script a good script is which represent all the sounds of the language that's i think that's a good definition so uh, yeah you just need to find a script which which uh, perfectly represents all the sound of your language and write extensively i mean having a script won't uh, ensure that your language the language will survive but if you have a lot of rit- literary material then it will ensure that uh, history is intact and then uh, it's get uh, like as, as i said like when you write you save it for the future you save it for a different instant of time so i would say more than focusing on script uh, 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 focus on writing your own history because th- that's something which is not done till now a lot of uh, uh, adivasi history or work on literature uh, the whole academic work uh, if you talk about the percentage uh, very less percentage of work has been done by the native community members but it's it's mostly people from outside the community uh, who has worked so i think um, yeah there's more need to write and uh, like adivasi should write their own history not that we depend on someone else to write the history yeah that's a great answer i i very much agree and also you know keep in mind that human beings or you know proto hominids have been talking for hundreds of thousands of years and writing is probably only about 5000 years old so people <laughs> passed on their languages just fine before writing for the majority of human history yeah um oh and somebody is waiting for munda written script so i don't know maybe this can be another project that you <laughs> contribute to in the future hercules yeah definitely yeah Uh, so uh, that, that, uh, that's a good support like okay i should work <laughs> you have enough projects at the moment but someday yeah, yeah someday definitely <laughs> yeah and so you know I, i don't want to take your whole evening it's getting late there but just to close are there any words of encouragement that you'd like to share with other adivasi language champions or just indigenous youth around the world who want to work for their languages and feel free to share these words in mundari if you want and just give us a rough translation or however you want to communicate uh, okay i'll, I'll, I'll i think uh, i would prefer hindi I, i'll definitely say in mundari but i'll prefer hindi because that's a larger like it will include other communities as well like and i'll also say in english so the first thing i want to say is uh, uh, don't the most important thing is to be proud of yourself Uh, you know uh, it's not uh, like we, we, because indigenous languages or communities are often uh, uh, seen with some stereotype and they are been belittled so uh, i think you should take proud in who you are you are who you are and uh, it's not your fault that you didn't had any uh, decision in being born into a adivasi community so embrace who you are that's that's the first thing i would say and uh, uh, then when when you embrace you, you you start to see good in everything because uh, otherwise we are wearing this lens and we try to negate everything so it's very important that you see things in a positive light and uh, whoever wants to promote their language i think uh, i would say it's a very good cause that you you have you are choosing to do uh, i'm also i'm very open because trilingual is not just uh, for mundari it's 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 
it's a uh, it it's represent the tribal languages or adivasi languages of, of india and across the globe so anybody who wants to who, who wants us to work or like trilingo to work in their language I, I, like i'll take the liberty of welcoming them and please feel free to reach me out or even elp is doing that so i think they are also uh, they are credit uh, like they 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 can be they'll definitely help you out and then trilingo is there to help you out uh, reach out to expertise who can help you and uh, um, i think at last the thing is just start i mean you know we often wait that someone else will do it or i people have lot of excuses that i don't have the right time i don't have uh, money or let's say uh, i i don't have the knowledge but i would say just start uh, just start one step at a time even if you spend one minute a day Uh, by the year you'll be spending like what five hours five hours that's that's so big and imagine that if you do that for next uh 10 years 50 50 hours that's like you that's a big thing and um, so just start and when you start uh, you'll see things i mean uh, in my personal case i have seen you know uh, things starting uh, things falling into place i mean uh, it takes a lot of courage i i will admit it like it takes a lot of courage and uh, but do it because it's 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 risky and do it because uh, nobody has done it do it because uh, it needs to be done and it, when you do it uh, things will fall in line i mean uh, it will happen you know that is beautiful advice thank you hercules i think that's that's really important for everybody here to hear yeah and any do you want to offer any closing words in languages of your choice yeah so hindi and mandari right yeah. so hindi sabhi hindi like sabhi se mera request hai anurodh hai ki apni bhasha apni samaj ke liye garv mehsoos kariye agar aap garv mehsoos karenge to aapke andar jo garv hoga wo duniya aapko dekhegi aur aap sabhi cheezon ko us पॉजिटिव तरीके से देखना शुरू एक 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 अच्छे नजरिए से उसको देखना शुरू करेंगे और जब आप काम अपनी भाषा के ऊपर आप अपनी भाषा के ऊपर गर्व महसूस करिएगा तो लोग आपको देख के और भी मतलब उसकी अहमियत को समझेंगे सो ये बहुत जरूरी है कि हम अपने भाषा और समाज को लेके गर्व महसूस करें और उसके अलावा अगर किसी को भी लगता है कि उन्हें नहीं आता है कुछ या फिर वो कैसे करेंगे मेरा सुझाव ये है कि आप शुरू करिए चीजें अपने आप होने लगेगी भंडारी सोविन के जवाहर अवा जगत ते सभी के सोविन के जवाहर अवा जगत बैसे के <laughs> I'm a bit scared. Oh, that's okay. I lost contact. <laughs> it is a lot of pressure doing it live. We we can record it later yeah. if you still want to. But uh I want yeah, to thank maybe. you again big time for talking to us today. This was a really great conversation. I'm so happy we got the chance to do this. And so really I want pleasure. everybody in the audience to give Hercules a giant round of applause for sharing his thoughts and experience today. He's doing amazing stuff. So everybody go check out trilingo.in you can learn more about the trilingo work they're also on Instagram here at trilingo.in and uh you can also learn more about Hercules and the other ELP interns this summer uh on our post introducing our summer interns We've got a bunch of other cool folks uh working with us this summer and we will be talking to them on future Instagram lives as we go forward So tune in to hear more perspectives from indigenous language champions around the world. And thank you, thank you, thank you Hercules. Everybody is applauding you in the comments. And uh take care everybody. Have a good evening or morning wherever you are. And remember to always be proud of your languages as Hercules said. All right everybody, take care. Bye. Bye.